together. Those words we just were singing, I will trust in my Redeemer. A Redeemer is one who buys you from slavery and sets you free. Lord Jesus, we want to say this morning that you are good and we hear these words, do not be afraid, little flock. For your Father has been pleased to give you a kingdom. Lord Jesus, we bless you as we gather this morning. And Lord, we've, we've thanked you for mothers. Lord, how we just thank you again for the precious women in this church and in our lives. Lord, we've heard about Mal uh, Mali, this grace ministries, Lord. The, the thing that went in my mind were those four words, Lord, simple, obedience changes history. Lord, may that be part of the life beat of this church, Lord, please. Lord, would you open our hearts now to your word? Lord, we've already been worshiping. We don't want to stop worshiping just because we hear a sermon. We want the sermon to be worshiped, Lord, please. And Lord, would you, would you actually set us free as we hear your word together this morning? Let's join together and let's pray that prayer that Jesus taught us, the, the family prayer of his church. And let's remember, this is a wartime prayer. It's not a prayer for ease and comfort, but for readiness for living for Jesus. Let's pray these words saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Um, my, my last aunt, aunt, A-U-N-T, my last aunt died this week in Little Rock, Arkansas, and my wife and I need to be at a family gathering in Little Rock tonight at 6.30. So after this morning's message, uh, you're going to see us run out that door, and it's not, we're not running away from Westbrook Church, we promise you. And, and I hope that you want someone to pray with you after the service this morning, because this message should provoke things in you, in which case Ricky's here to pray, Chad's here to pray, the elders are here to pray, and the person next to you is here to pray. Please let us not leave this building without having engaged with God, right? Otherwise, why are we here? So if you see us leave quickly, please understand that's why. Pray for a safe trip. It's, it's, it, we'll get there just in time if everything goes well. So please pray for that. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus is preaching a sermon. It's one of the longest sermons recorded in the Gospels. And it's an incredibly serious sermon that he's preaching. Luke 12 begins with a crowd of thousands of people having gathered. And Jesus is saying about being on our guard against the Pharisees and against hypocrisy. He says, don't be afraid of those who can kill your body. Be afraid only of God. And you're worth more than many sparrows. And if you disown me before men, I'll disown you before my father. And when you're bought before authorities at the synagogue, don't worry about what to say. The Holy Spirit will give you utterance. He's saying all these incredible things. And right in the middle of the sermon, someone interrupts him. And says, hey, Jesus, tell my brother to give me my money. Right in the middle of the sermon. Jesus is talking about being persecuted. He's talking about not denying the Father. He's talking about the Holy Spirit being with you. And someone in the service is totally caught up in their own agenda. Jesus, tell my brother to give me my money. It's all that's on his mind. Now, I don't know what, what's on your mind this morning. 
I hope your mind is engaged in God and the gospel. By the way, you, you get out of worship what you bring into worship. The piano player is not the priest. The pastor is not the priest. Jesus is the priest. You get your heart ready. You come to church. I want to hear from God. You get things out of the service. This guy was totally missing where Jesus was going. He wanted Jesus to serve him but not save him. But amazingly, Jesus accepts the interruption. And from that interruption gives us one of the most profound teachings Jesus has ever given about the value of life. And finally, ending in these words, do not be afraid, little flock. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you a kingdom. And it's that sentence that we're going to move to this morning and feast upon But first we have to deal with the interrupter. The one who provoked Jesus to give a, tell us a parable that's become one of the most famous short stories ever told. The interrupter who is not listening to being on guard against hypocrisy. He's not listening to fearing only God. He's not listening to not disowning Jesus. He's not listening to any of that. He wants money. So Jesus stops everything. And he addresses the man's cry, and he begins in verse 14. Man who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you. Then he said to them, to the whole crowd, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. That's one end of the teaching. The other end of the teaching is, do not be afraid, little flock. It's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So those are the two ends of the teaching there. In the middle, he tells us a parable about a man whose life consisted in the abundance of his possessions. Verse 16, he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. So far, there's no problem. That's good. Everybody wants a good crop. This is a good thing in verse 16. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. Isn't God good? The problem begins in the next verse. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. In the next Four verses, he uses the word I or my, the personal pronoun, 12 times. There's zero reference to God in the whole thing. There's no no indication that in any way he gave thanks. There's no indication that in any way he acknowledged, this has come from God. That's why I am blessed. The Bible does not teach that you cannot have a good crop. The Bible does not teach that you cannot do well. That's not the problem here. The problem here is that the abundance, this man's life consisted in the abundance of his possessions. Now, if you'd have been his neighbor, and if you had driven by over the next weeks and months as he's building bigger barns, you, unless you were spiritually switched on, you would have thought, This guy is really sharp. Look what he's doing. He's building bigger barns. He's wise. Maybe he was interviewed on Good Morning Israel or whatever it was. Maybe he was on the front of whatever magazine was taking place. Look what this great wise man has done. And he felt he was secure. His life was now beyond risk. He tells us that. He says, take life easy. You have plenty of goods laid up for many years. Eat, drink, and be merry. This is the American dream. He's he's living it. He's living what many of us hope we will live. But Jesus tells us in verse 20 what God thinks. And can I suggest to you this morning 
that what God thinks is always what counts. What God thinks about your marriage, what God thinks about your hobbies, what God thinks about your private life, what God thinks about Westbrook. You know, we often leave church on a Sunday and say, well, how was church this morning? Well, you, you know, don't ask me. Ask God. It's his worship service. It's his church. How was the music? Don't ask me. Ask God. How was the sermon? Well, ask God. What God thinks about you and about me and about every affair of life is what matters. And Jesus tells us in verse 20 what God thought about this man. But God said to him, you fool. Now, why was he a fool? Not because his ground produced a good crop. That's not why he was a fool. He was a fool because he forgot he had a soul. There was no reference to to eternity in his life. I, 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 me, 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 my, 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 now I am safe, now I am secure, now all is well with me. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. You see, God can demand our life from us anytime. This man thought he was beyond the pale of risk. We're never beyond it. Not one of us in this room today has any idea what's going to happen before this day is over. Not one of us. And if our lives are not built upon the character of God, then we are fools. End of story. And America today, and I'm thankful for prosperity, I'm thankful that we're not poor like our friends in Mali, but maybe they're rich in some ways that we're not rich. America today... The West today, we are putting so much of our stock in the abundance of our possessions, and God says we're foolish. That's what God says. So this man had built his dream house. Don't build your dream house on earth, because Jesus is building it in heaven. Don't expect this life to fulfill you. That's what this man was doing. That's why he was a fool. So here's his funeral, and at his funeral, people are talking about how wise he is, how amazing he was, how much money he made. It's all amazing in their eyes, but we know better. Then who will get what you have prepared, prepared for yourself? And then Jesus says, this is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich toward God. Now, that's the first half of this story. Remember, Jesus has been interrupted in a sermon. Here's the first half. He's building to a great moment in this, in this interruption. It's going to get so wonderful in just a few moments. Keep this man in mind. He might be describing you or who you wish you were. I hope he's not. Because if your life consists in the abundance of your possessions, you're a fool, according to God. Verse 22, then Jesus said to his disciples, he's not speaking to the crowd now, he's speaking to his disciples. He's speaking to this group of men and women who've left everything behind to follow Jesus. They've left the idea of of living like this man behind and maybe sometimes they regret it maybe they're sometimes they're thinking you know have I made a bad move here to follow Jesus the rest of this story I actually preached in this church a couple years ago so if anyone's thinking I think he did that before I did and I make no apology for that because just like pizza is always good truth is always good <laughs> and a story is always good and this is always good and this is important and he tells us this wonderful parable. He begins by saying, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or drink. Life's more than food, the body more than clothes. The world forgets that. Consider the ravens. They don't sow. They don't reap. They have no storeroom. They have no barn, yet God feeds them. Now, 
God does tell us to sow and reap and work. Jesus is not saying here, don't work. He's not saying that. The Bible commands us to. But all Jesus is saying is, look, these creatures don't, and yet God takes care of them. Now you do it honestly and faithfully, re remembering God, and see what God will do. That's what Jesus is saying here. How much more valuable are you than the birds? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? This is one of the hardest things to obey in the Bible, isn't it? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was clothed like, like one of these. You know the billions of flowers on earth? Only God sees most of them. You might see one every now and then. God sees all of them and they bless him. If this is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. Isn't, isn't this our culture to a T? We're just, we're just food mad. They actually, I, I watch the news every morning. I, I'm not quite sure why, because I guess it takes me back to eighth grade, which is about the level of it. And <laughs> they, they actually have news headlines when uh, Wendy's brings out new chicken nug nuggets or something. It's in the news. Watch it. It does. It makes the news. Do not set your heart on these things, for the pagan world runs after such things, and your father knows you need them. Verse 31, but seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Now, that's one of the greatest spiritual principles of discipleship in the New Testament. As a priority, I seek the kingdom of God preeminently in my life. I want to live for Jesus. I want to reference him with every aspect of my life, not just some of my life, but with every aspect, I want to reference Christ as Lord, and then I want to watch and see what God does in my life. This is a huge faith verse. Again, he's in nowhere commanded that we don't work, that we don't save, that we don't be diligent. That's not the point here. It's not the point. And then he comes with this statement. He's just said, seek the kingdom. And then in verse 32, he says this. Do not be afraid, little flock. For your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Verse 31, seek it. Verse 32, don't be afraid to seek it. Because your father's pleased to give it. John Piper wrote these words about this verse 32. Every little word of this stunning sentence is intended to help take away the fear that Jesus knows that we struggle with. Namely, that God begrudges his benefits. That he's constrained and out of character when he does nice things. That at the bottom he's angry. And loves to vent his anger. This is a sentence about the nature of God. It's a sentence about the kind of heart that God has. It's a verse about what makes God glad. Not mere, merely about what God will do or what he has to do, but what he delights to do, what he loves to do, what he takes pleasure in doing. Do not be afraid, little flock. It is your father's pleasure to give you the kingdom. So here's a man who builds bigger, bigger things. It's all about him. And here's Jesus saying, don't do that. Reference Jesus and his kingdom preeminently in your life. And don't be afraid to do that. Let me tell you a story of a gospel hero of mine. I have many, many gospel heroes, some in this church. 
John G. Payton, Scotsman. In 1858, he marries Mary, and she becomes his wife. They leave for the New Hebrides, South Pacific Islands, 30 islands, cannibal islands. The elders in his church in Scotland say, they will eat you. And Peyton says, and the worms will eat you. And he says, I don't care if I'm eaten by worms or cannibals. It makes no difference to me. March 1859, on the New Hebrides, Mary dies. Three weeks later, their son dies. Peyton writes in his diary, but for Jesus, I would have gone mad by that lonely grave. He travels to Australia. He meets Maggie. He and Maggie are married, and they go back to the Hebrides. They lose four children there. They spend 40 years there. They see the entire main island profess Christ. The New Testament printed into their language and missions uh, established on 25 of the 30 islands. Simple obedience changes history. But I read stories like that, and I think, how does someone do that? Do you think that? How, does he, how do you do that? I look at some of your lives, who, that you're living for Jesus, and I think, how do you do that? Some of you amaze me in your own ways. Here's how you do it. You have to be convinced of the character of God. You got to know what God's like. And you got to know that discipleship is not easy. And the surrendered life, the surrendered life, Lord, I'm surrendering my life to you, is not an easy life. And it's filled with questions. And I am not exhibit A of the surrendered life. I am not. Go read mission biographies, and I've read tons of them. And I will tell you that missionaries who are used by God go through so many trials, it's unbelievable. It's never easy. But God gets glorified in it. And it's knowing the character of God expressed in this verse. Do not be afraid, little flock. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Let's just look at this verse for a few minutes. Number one, this, word has, this verse has the word pleasure in it. It gives God pleasure to give us all that he has in Christ. And listen, one day we'll have it in fullness. We are heirs of all that is in Christ. Do we know that? We do not live to get our dreams fulfilled in the here and now. We don't. And if we do, we are headed for endless disappointment. In this world, the only thing worse than, than unfulfilled dreams are fulfilled dreams. You get all your dreams fulfilled and you think, is that it? We're made for eternity. And it's our Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. Brothers and sisters, heaven is ahead for us. It's wonderful here sometimes. We're headed for glory. And God is pleased. It's not his grudging duty. It's not something he's compelled outside of himself to do. Well, I guess I have to be nice to him because they gave their lives to Jesus. I wish they hadn't, but they have. So no, this is his heart. This is what God is really like. How do you stand beside a, lone, a, lo a lonely grave in the New Hebrides? You've got to know what God's like, and you've got to know there's a kingdom coming, and heaven is ahead, and you have to say, I'm living for that. And I'm not going to turn back to the other way. I'm not going to become that man who says, forget God. I'll take care of myself. I'll build bigger barns. I'm not going to become that person. Because I know what God's like. From the fullness of his grace, the Bible says, 
We've received one blessing after another, not all in fullness yet. I'm not offering here in any way, shape, or form an easy life. And I know there are some of you here this morning, dear, precious saints, and you have earnestly and truly, as much as you know how, given all of yourself to Jesus, and it's been hard. be afraid little flock it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom it's coming it really is don't give up don't go back look what else he says it's your father's good pleasure I know it's mother's day but here Jesus says it's your father's good pleasure not your employer's good pleasure to give you a salary that you've earned Or even a king's pleasure to give you a kingdom. But it's your father's pleasure to give you a kingdom. How else do you keep following Jesus? How else do you live the surrendered life? How else do you do it? How do you keep from defaulting back to, well, I just got to get all I can get in this life. How do, we, how do we be men and women, boys and girls, families, and a company of people who say, let's live for Jesus? How do you surrender your children to the mission field? Knowing that they might die there. This is how. It's my father's good pleasure to give me a kingdom. He's my father. Not just my boss, he's not just my king, but my father is a king. And he has a kingdom. His whole heart is into this. Brothers and sisters, unless you, unless I, unless Westbrook Church understands the heart of God, we'll never make true progress in mission or in living for Jesus because we'll always be afraid. God's whole heart is into this. Don't be afraid, little flock. It's your father's good pleasure to do this. Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 41. Listen to what God says through the prophet. I will rejoice in doing you good with all my heart and soul. That's what God's like to his people. I will rejoice in doing you good with all my heart and soul. I told someone the story this morning of J.I. Packer. I don't know how many of you have read the book Knowing God. It's one of the greatest gifts to our generation that could have ever been written, and Packer wrote many, many, many other books. When he was a little boy, little tiny tot, he suffered a, a very traumatic head injury. The kind of thing that if it happened to your child, you would be tempted to say, where's God? Uh, My recollection is he lived most of his life without a a sizable portion of his skull. Okay, the doctor said your your son can never play sports, can never run, can never do any such thing like that again. Don't be afraid, little flock. It's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. His parents bought him a typewriter. And he became J.I. Packer. He's written more Christian books that have helped more people around the world than almost any Christian author. Don't be afraid, little flock. I will rejoice in doing you good with all my heart and with all my soul. Jesus said, if we being evil, if we being evil, know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? We have a God who's pleased to confer on us a kingdom more than anything this world has to offer. Do you believe that? More than anything this world has to offer. I hope you have dreams that demand eternity. Dreams that nothing on earth can fulfill something in your heart says, I, I demand it. I've got to have eternity. Well, you have it. It's your father's pleasure 
to give you the kingdom. Look, it says right there, not sell you the kingdom. We don't buy our way into heaven. Not loan you the kingdom. Here, you can have it for a while as long as you behave really well. Otherwise, I'm taking it back. Or not trade you the kingdom, but to give it. It's all grace. The best Christians are simply the best receivers. Lord, I want everything you have for me, no matter what it costs me personally. And I can pray that, Lord, because you're good. Can you pray that? Lord, I want all that you have for me. No matter what it costs me personally, Lord. And I can pray that because you're good. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. What's the qualification for receiving the kingdom? Emptiness. Thirstiness. Weakness. Jesus, give me all that you have for me, please. I want to live for your glory. I want my life to make a difference. I don't want to be an earthbound short-sighted, blind churchgoer. I want to follow Jesus. Jesus said, everyone who is thirsty, come to me and drink. The qualification for the kingdom is not strength, but thirst. Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 8, I have cleansed you from all guilt, and I have forgiven your sins, and you shall be a joy and a praise and a glory to me, God says. Wow. You cleanse me and then I'm a joy to you? What a God. I thought you'd cleanse me and say, now go away. Well, he cleanses you and say, now come on. I'm your father and I want to give you my kingdom. God gives eternal life. God gives a new heart. God gives a full measure, shaken down, pressed down, and running over. That's what God's like. And that's how we live for Jesus. The most important thing about you and the most important thing about me is what we think about God. It's more important than anything else. If we have a poor view of God, we will never live lives of significance for the kingdom. And we will end our days in a whisper and a sigh. And they'll have our funeral. And I'm going to say, wasn't he great? He did this and he did that. And they'll give little golf applause over us. You know what a golf applause. Very polite little applause. Nobody's going to erupt with joyful outbursts of praise Jesus for this life. And then he says, don't be afraid, little flock. That's what he's just called us, a little flock. Isn't that beautiful? Think of that, of the affection in that phrase, little flock. It's a beautiful phrase. We're his little flock. You see, the world is impressed with big, isn't it? And that's invaded the church. The church is impressed with big. We want to be big. Don't be afraid. Little flock, dear, cared for, dependent and it's not dependent on our size. We're a little flock. And we get a kingdom. And Jesus can use us. And Jesus wants to do things through our lives for his glory, even though we're just a little flock. That's all we are. But we're his little flock. Isn't this, one, isn't this totally different than how the world thinks? Little flocks, they're defenseless. They're harmless. And they're precious. Bought with the blood of Jesus is the flock of God. There's nothing more precious to Jesus in the universe than his little flock. That's you and me if we believe in Christ. So Jesus says, don't be afraid, little flock. Listen, we're not here to try to be impressive. But isn't that wonderful? Can't we just be delivered from that? We're not, finally, 
I don't have to impress God or anybody else. Is that a freedom? We're just a little flock. Harmless, defenseless, priceless. He affectionately cares for us. The Bible says he lifts us and carries us on his shoulders. And look what he gives us. He gives us a kingdom. Not worldly wealth, not worldly popularity. Read the rest of the New Testament. Christians suffer. Christians pay for it. But we're getting a kingdom. Brothers and sisters, the best is yet to come. Live for that. Believe for that. Know that. No matter what it costs today to say yes to Jesus, to keep surrendering, just keep doing it. Well, I surrendered and it hadn't worked. Surrender again. Just keep doing it. It's the Christian life. Well, I gave everything to Jesus and it got really hard. Yeah, fine. Read your Bible. That's what happens. But he loves you. Therefore, sell your possessions, give to the poor, provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. This is exactly the opposite of, of that man we just we learned of. A treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thief comes near, no moth destroys, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So Jesus says, and it's a huge challenge, surrender it. Surrender it. Balance. There's a moment's balance because we're all thinking it. Does that mean I can't own stuff? No. The Bible does not forbid personal ownership. But it means we get to a place of truly saying, Lord, I, I am continually surrendering my life to you in whatever way it means. And for some people, it might literally mean I'm getting rid of everything and I'm going to go do this other thing. It might really mean that for some. For others, it will mean I'm going to use the wealth I have dynamically for the kingdom. We heard a story about that this morning. It's the surrendered life. Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is more wonderful than we have even begun to imagine. And it's being enraptured with the wonders of the character and nature of God that sets people free to live dramatically for Jesus. Don't look at me as example A, please. Go read missionary biographies. Look at some other people in this church and say, I want to do that. I want to do that. It is never said it will be easy. Okay, fast forward, then we're close. It's 200 years from now, it's 200 years from now, and it's your family gathering, and it's your great, 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 great grandkids. There's a whole bunch of them now. They're all gathered together, and they're celebrating life, and they've been living for Jesus, and it's been a legacy of meaningful lives for 200 years now, and they hold up a picture, and it's a picture of you. Maybe you and your wife, or maybe you're single. Just a picture of you. And they say, this is our great, 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 great aunt, uncle, grandmother, mom and dad, whatever. Great, great, great. They lived way back in 2000. They had something called iPhones back then. And they did this thing called with their thumbs. I don't know what it was. but They lived for Jesus. And that's why we're here today. Most of us don't have a plan that goes past the weekend. I would suggest you should have a 200-year plan. And then take it into eternity. Do not be afraid, little flock. It's our Father's good pleasure to give us his kingdom. Let's stand together and pray, and Chad and company will come. If after this you want to pray with somebody, please grab the person next to you and say, pray with me, please. i got to deal with some things. Or come up and find an elder. They'll be here. Or Chad and Ricky, they'll pray with you.
Father, we thank you for the God that you are. We thank you that you are the God that you tell us you are in the Bible. And you are wonderful. Lord, may we not be fools. May we be those who say we are happy to be the little flock of God. Deliver us from fear in trusting in your goodness and set us free to live for Jesus, knowing that a kingdom is coming. In Jesus' name we pray.